Let's all stand together. We'll open a word of prayer. Glad to have all of you here this evening. Look forward to a great service tonight. And uh, God is so good. Today is September 11th. We know what happened in 2001. I was sitting in this auditorium, uh, and it was filled up with people. It was a Tuesday night, and nobody knew what was going on other than we were under attack. And uh, I believe uh, a lot of people got so-called spiritual that night until things started to shake out. And I pray that uh, we would, tonight, I want to pray for uh, those uh, first responders who died, for all those who worked in the financial service industry, and the most of them did, that were in the World Trade Center that died. And uh, let's, let's open in a word of prayer uh, for the 9-11 victims and their families. Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight remembering a tragic, tragic day in the life of the United States of America. And I do pray for the families of those that are still struggling with fathers and sometimes even grandfathers that uh, life was taken from them. I do pray for those that have been left behind that they can seek your will and your way and come to know you as Savior. And I do pray for those special, those that protect our country, both in the military and law enforcement, first responders, firemen, and Lord, we thank you for their service. And I do pray that we, as a country, can turn back to you and turn back to God. And Lord, I ask that you guide and direct uh, in this service as well tonight as um, we have this special day to remember. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. I know whom I believe in. dismiss the teens and uh, if you open your prayer bulletin just a couple of items I'd like to make note of number one if you have any additional requests please if you don't mind tearing off the strip on the side and fill it out and then put in the offering plate when it's passed in a few moments that way we'll get a record of that and we'll mention those here tonight uh, here as well and I hope um, you're all aware of course we're making a service change in a week from Sunday and uh, we have a special letter going out to you with a magnet for your refrigerator just to kind of reminding you to invite people. And uh, we've called it Making Room for More is our, uh, our 
our theme, and we're looking forward to that. When we go to the two services on uh, the 22nd, we will have a tent which will be in the uh, pull-through. Now, if you need the handicap area, there'll be a place where you can come in, but we'll have a tent there. We're going to have tables out with kind of refreshments and coffee and just kind of a, a kickoff launch. That will have some music playing, and as you come in for, the ser for both services, and that will be also at the 930 service and the 11 as well. And then we're really excited about what we're starting to find out is momentum is building toward our Sunday night uh, seed groups in the Sunday school classes. And we're looking forward to that as people are inviting the children, the teens have a, their own program going on. They will meet in, right over there. You don't have to meet here and go over there. You start out over there. That will be from 5 o'clock to 6 o'clock. We have a couples class. We're going to be starting a new series. And we're looking forward to a great, great thing, the men's class as well, and the ladies' class. So we got a lot going on, and I hope uh, that not only will you be there with your children, we have something for the entire family, and that's what we've made it to be. And uh, looking forward to that as we get started. And uh, a lot of prayer requests we have on the left-hand side. We'll go through all of those as we pray later on, and we'll mention those in prayer. And, of course, encouragement cards if you have somebody you would like to pray for this evening. And God is so good. All right, well, let's stand together. We'll sing our next song, and then we'll dismiss the teens. After that, God's word shall stand forever.
verse 3, I'll trust in God's unchanging word. Excuse me, God's unchanging word till soul and body settles. Verse number 3, I'll trust in God. I think we covered most of this one, and gentlemen, come forward if you would for our offering. Appreciate your faithfulness in giving. If you did not have a chance to give to our one offering on Sunday, you can go on the app and take care of that. We still have that link up there on the front page, I believe, and also you can give in the offering plate tonight if you will identify that as being for the Awana offering. Team Book High Rally, is this, this is one of the best teen events of the whole year, and I uh, really am recommending that uh, if you can get there, it's no cost for our teens. We used extra money from the wilds to cover everything, and they're leaving at 5 a.m., coming back at 9 o'clock. I guess the teens can be dismissed, so I see them all leaving. So I guess that's happening. So, you know, it's never good when a preacher gets up to speak and people get to start up leaving. So uh, anyway. But uh, anyway, so that's this upcoming week. They have uh, all kind of games, tug of war, and they have great, great preaching. Uh, Kurt Skelly, I believe, is there, and Kenny Baldwin, the two fellows you see on the screen, dynamic preachers, and they will really hit a home run, and we're looking forward to uh, hearing results of what's going to take place this upcoming Saturday. The only thing I, that some of us don't like, it's called Buckeye Rally, uh, if it could be called something. I don't mind the Buckeyes, but we have some Penn State. We could call it the Nittany Lion Rally, but it would have to be in Pennsylvania, I guess, anyway. All right, and uh, ladies' prayer gathering this um, Saturday, uh, this upcoming Saturday, at, excuse me, Saturday the 21st at 9.30, and it's in the prayer chapel, and we'll be making more of an announcement about that as well. And then there's an open house the first night of our, uh, our new uh, changes for Sunday school. There'll be an open house for the teens that'll be at the lodge, and we really want all the parents to go to that. And looking, that'll be from 4 to 4.45, that'll be before we start our new programs at 5 o'clock, and looking forward to that. I have a lot to talk about, uh, some, uh, some uh, teen activities and uh, everything else. And if you want to know what's going on in the teen group, go to the app. It has everything on there already identified, and you can sign up as well. And I believe that's it, tithes and offerings. Let's uh, pray for the, uh, the tithes this evening. And I'd like my good friend, Brother Ralph Emus, if you could come up and pray. Thank you, God, for the privilege you've given us to return to you a portion of what you've entrusted us. We just pray that you be with this offering. Help us to use it for the furtherance of the gospel. Pray that you be with our pastor in the service that follows, that we use him again to challenge our hearts afresh and anew. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. In our Bibles, if you have them with you, we're in the uh, book of Philippians tonight. 
Uh, we had a wonderful time. I believe I enjoyed it, and I hope you did as well, going through uh, the book of Nehemiah. And tonight we're going to go through, we'll start in a series that will last a uh, you know, month or two or so uh, on the book of Philippians. I've never preached through the entire book of Philippians before, so I'm looking forward to that as well. And we're in Philippians chapter 1, and I want you to stand together out of respect of reading in God's holy word. And we're going to look at the first six verses tonight. And uh, lots, lots of information there. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all make and request with joy that your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I want you to look at verse number 4, please. And this is where we will launch at least the subject matter for tonight. And I hope this will be an encouragement and blessing to all. It says in verse number 4, Always in prayer of mine for you all, making request with what? Say it. Joy. I want to preach a message I've simply titled tonight, Biblical success. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this epistle, this small book written to the church at Philippi, a church that was formed as a pioneering spirit of a man that was called to Macedonia by different peoples, a Philippian jailer, a lady of purple, Lydia, and Lord, many, many others. And Lord, as we study this book, let it not just be an academic exercise of biblical, as we call it, exegesis. Let it be one where it's practical and the application touches all of us. I pray for guidance and direction that you would fill me with the Spirit tonight as we launch this new series on Wednesday. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. You may be seated. There's a lot here that we find in this particular book. We find a couple of things. You might want to circle some key words we'll briefly touch tonight. We see Paul and Timotheus, we see that word servants. That's a, what we can, the doulos servant, a slave of Christ. I will not cover that tonight, but that's one direction we could have gone. They're servants. And then it's written to the saints. That would be those that are saved, those in the church, those who have accepted Christ as their Savior. This is not written to a group of people. This book was not penned to any group for evangelical purposes. It was more for the presence, the encouragement, and doctrine. And then verse number 2, the couple of words, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll cover that. Grace must come before peace. Many people try to get peace before they have grace. And we'll talk about that. And I believe the order there is very, very important. And then verse number 3, it says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. And that is looking backward, this, this epistle, this book was penned as, raw, as Paul was writing from a Roman jail years after the church at Philippi was started. And he's looking back at this group and thanking God for their helping him, especially later on with what we believe is a remuneration or an offering that was sent to him. And then in verse number 5 is something. It says, for your fellowship or partnership in the gospel. 
You're working together, fellowship, partnership with me in the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And then verse number 6, we like to memorize. That is one, I would say, of a memory verses that many people use. I have quoted it many times by memory. I actually like to tie it into verse number 12, and I've done that before. But he says something interesting. He's saying, hold on, hang in there. God's going to let you see His glory. And I want you to tell you the best days may, or excuse me, are ahead. He says, being confident of this very thing, He that hath begun a good work in you will complete it, will perform it. And of course, he's talking about redemption and glorification there in the day of Jesus Christ. A lot there to chew on. But we find this, the element, the the atmosphere in which Paul was writing, everybody look here, was pretty discouraging. In fact, it was really, 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 really bad. He's in a Roman prison, but you don't see that coming out here. He had every reason to be discouraged and disheartened. This is one that we call the prison epistles. It reminds me of another person that penned a great literary work in prison. His name is John Bunyan. He said there when he was in prison, as I walked through the wilderness of the world, said John Bunyan, I lighted on a certain place where was a den, and I laid me down in that place to sleep. As I slept, I dreamed a dream, and behold, I saw a man clothed with rags standing in a certain place with his face from his own house, a book in his hand, and a great burden on his back. That den that he quoted was the Bedford Jail in England, in which Bungeon was imprisoned for 12 years for preaching the gospel, and it's where he wrote Pilgrim's Progress for which centuries was the best seller only to the Bible. It was written in 1678, and by the end of the 19th century, had sold millions upon millions of copies, and that was well over 150 years ago, and is written in 12 languages with different dialects, and all that was done in a prison cell. I want to give you the background of this as we introduce this subject matter tonight. And let's go to Acts chapter number 16. Acts 16. I want to show you something that's interesting. We all get discouraged about our conditions, right? We get upset about certain situations that may not conform to our expectations of where we should be in life. Sometimes that can lead to anxiety, depression. And by the way, those are real. I've known very close people, and from time to time, frankly, I've kind of toyed with that even in my own life. And sometimes we get to the point where we realize that either God's in charge or He's not. See, the Apostle Paul was writing from a prison cell. But let's look how this church started. Acts chapter 16 really is we we must throw ourselves, we must jump over to Acts 16 to understand Philippians at all. You must know, how did this church start? How did it get there? Let's unlock the key. Let's unlock the door, okay? I want you to look at verse number 9. Good stuff. See, Paul had no intention in his missionary journey to go into what we call modern-day Lower Europe or Macedonia. He had an agenda that was set. How many of you ever been set on doing something and nothing's going to change your mind and God had to intervene? You ever had that happen? It happened to me. Well, Paul was that way. And it says in verse number 9 of Acts chapter 16, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. And there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, in other words, saying to him, Come over into Macedonia 
and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. You know where he wanted to go? He wanted to go into Asia. He wanted to go into Asia further east, but wound up going southwest to Macedonia. So it says in verse number 11, Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with straight course to the Mecca, next to Nepopolis, rather. Nepopolis, rather. And from there to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony which were in that city, excuse me, and a, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. And on the, on, on the Sabbath, the Sabbath day, we went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was wont to be made. This was not a Jewish area. This was a Gentile area. But guess what he found? When God led him there, there was somebody that he was supposed to meet. Look at it. And we sat down and spoke unto the woman which was ordered thither. And a certain woman, verse 14, named Lydia, a seller of purple, the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us. Now look at verse 14. Do not miss this, ladies and gentlemen. Whose heart the Lord opened. That she should tend to the things which are spoken of Paul. And when she was baptized and her household, she besought us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and abide there. And she constrained us. She begged them, look, come here. Now let me just tell you something. This is the start of the church. Well, later on, Paul heals the damsel and he gets in trouble, goes to jail. I will not read the whole chapter. And he's in jail. And, and while he's in the prison, a, Conversion of a Philippian jailer is converted. Go down to chapter 16. Go all the way down. Let's see. Verse number 25. And at midnight, Paul is now in jail for the healing there. This is after, this is later, after the woman of Thyatira has told him to come to Philippi. And look what he's doing in prison. He prayed and sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard him. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's bands were loosed. Now, how would you like to be in that prison? Boom! Everybody's chains are gone, all the doors are open. And Paul says, don't miss this. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, drew out his sword and would have killed himself. See, if that prison guard had let any of them escape, he was done. He was going to commit suicide and fall on a sword, but look what Paul said. He said, this is really good. He says, and would have killed him, so supposing the prisoner had been fled. But look at verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. We're all here. Nobody left the prison. So. Then he called for a light and sprang and came trembling. This is this old rough, Prison, a prison guard, Roman type prison guard, a rough man, a big man, no doubt, probably a strong man. He's coming in verse number 28. It's 29. He says, Come trembling, tell down, fell down before Silas. In verse 30, and he brought him out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? We find in verses 31 down to verses 34, he gets saved when they're healing his stripes, they're taking Paul's and healing him there. Uh, his family got saved and a church was begun. Now here's the point I want to make. Everybody look here. A church was started. Now don't miss this. With a wealthy woman from Thyatira, a seller of purple, and a ragtag prison guard. That was the beginning of the church at Philippi. Now let's go back to Philippians chapter number 1. That gives you a little bit of the background of the start of the church, and there's much more there we may cover later. But here's the point. He's reflecting back in chapter 1. How many of you ever look back and you have nostalgic memories? You say, wow, 
You know, you get done with a vacation, and you go, how did it go? It went so, it was just, we started, and it's already over. You know, I look back on the vacation we took this summer, which we took our grandkids. It seems like we just left, and then it ended. Paul Roth, he wrote, thinking of his dear friends at Philippi. And we see that. And we know that. And if we look at these stanzas of this epistle in Philippians, we might think that Paul was in a palace, not in a prison. There's no indication of that. See, Philippi was a Macedonian, Macedonian hill town overlooking the coastal plain. Paul arrived there fresh from Troas, where he had just seen a vision, a man of Macedonia, and he started the church, and now he's writing a letter back to them. Now here's the point. Let's look at it. So how do we have... Biblical success. This is where he leads this in. He's leading in and making some statements here. I don't want you to miss this. Now here's where the rubber hits the road. This is very, 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 very practical and applicable today in our culture. Look at the first point, please. If we could just get a hold of this, a lot of heartache, would be gone. A mentor, somebody that leads, somebody that teaches, and somebody who's willing to follow and listen. You will see there's somebody he mentions in verse number one. Look what it is. He says, Paul and Timotheus. Timothy was being mentored by Paul. They're linked together at the opening of this epistle. They're linked together, and this doesn't mean that Timmy helped him write the letter. It's he's following and being mentored by Paul. And what we need, ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, if we are going to have a biblical model of success, we must have biblical mentors. The do-it-yourself DIY church is destroying the fabric of Christianity everywhere. And I've seen it. And we've got a culture that doesn't want to hear things. And I could just stop right there and talk about it. I had a mentor, and I'm standing behind this pulpit because I had a pastor and some friends that helped guide and direct and in Fred Ayer. When I came to be the pastor of this church, there are two people in here, that only two that are in the church now that were there there. This one and actually three, Wes, Angie, and Sheila, I think were the only ones here. And they asked me, I said, when you call me to be the pastor of this church, I will preach, I will expound the scripture, but I'm here to be a pastor, not just a preacher. Huge difference. You can go to a church, you can go to a place where a man will preach the word of God and then hit the exits and don't show up for another week. You have all you did, you might as well just listen to something online. And ladies and gentlemen, that describes a large portion of what goes on in churches today. And it's just not the pastors that should mentor. It should be men, older men, mentoring younger people and younger people willing to listen. And that's what Paul is doing. He is showing right out of the gate. He's mentoring Timothy. His preacher boy, if you want to call him that. One writer said this, those two, it's the union of the springtime and the autumn. Now, I would be called the autumn now, maybe late autumn, I don't know. But... Uh, I know I'm not in the spring of my life anymore. Enthusiasm and experience, impulse and wisdom, tender hope and quiet and rich assurance. That describes these two fellows. I thought that was good. They were both bond servants or doulos servants in the Greek of Jesus Christ. We can say that ties and bounds of Calvary hold them together. Mentoring is a biblical idea. And we can see numerous examples of that. Sometimes it's one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to have a men's class here that we're asking some of our men to go to. So 
not that we can just mentor each other, but we can grow in grace in the Lord. That'll be on Sunday nights as well. Jesus mentored 12 disciples, did he not? We find mentoring all through the Bible. Jephro, for a time, mentored Moses. Moses mentored Joshua. Joshua mentored the other remaining leaders. Eli mentored Samuel. Samuel mentored David and Saul. David mentored Solomon. Elijah mentored uh, Joash and others. Daniel uh, mentored actually Nebuchadnezzar who humbled himself before God. Mordecai mentored Esther. Priscilla and Aquila here in Acts mentored Apollos. Jesus mentored the 12 apostles. The apostles mentored hundreds of other leaders. Paul mentored Titus and Timothy, and Timothy mentored faithful men, as we see in the Scripture. So don't tell me it's not biblical. Biblical success requires mentoring. We see that. We see it a lot. And uh, one of the things we see In some churches, I would say 50%. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't have any data, so I'm not quote me on this. But I, a huge portion of churches in America are way out of balance. They're either mostly elderly or mostly extremely young. There's some. And I'm saying it's maybe 25, 40, maybe even 50%. Praise God, we have a church that's a mature, growing church. A church that's reaching the community and has a biblical model is not overly populated with one or the other. I believe there's both that's needed. There's several churches that are kind of the popular church with young people here and we actually had somebody said, yeah, my grandkids came to, came to Erie. I told them to come here, but they wouldn't go there. They're going to XYZ, and I don't want to mention the church. And the average age there is probably 28 or 29. And I'm not going to talk about doctrine or anything like that. I'm not going to criticize what they say. But I'm saying, where is the biblical mentoring going? Wisdom and youth do not necessarily rest on the same shoulders. Now, here's the problem. Is... Sometimes it cuts both ways. A person has to want to be mentored, but somebody that's older and mature has to want to mentor as well and not lecture and put down. It's interesting. I did a lot of studying on uh, Generation Z and Generation and Millennials. Lots of study. I read all the time. And here's one of the, the surveys for those that are millennials, which were born between, I think, 1982 and like 2005 or something. I can't remember the date. Is they lack some, not all, because you put them in a, they lack a willingness to listen to the seniors because they don't know the technology that they know, and they feel they're out of touch with reality. Now, that's totally wrong to do that, right? I mean, in other words, you don't know Facebook. You know, I mean, this is really a biblical issue, right? You don't know Facebook. You can't do apps. You can't, you know, go on and code a website, and not that they all can do it either. So because you don't know all of that stuff, and this was a study, I believe it was either in the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, so it must be true, right? But anyway, the point is, it was done that way, and because they don't know how to do that, the millennials look at somebody who may have a little gray hair, have lots of wisdom, but they look at them and say, they have no idea what they're talking about. Now, that, that's true, and I've almost seen that here, I mean, to some degree. And yeah, we have all of that stuff. Now, here's what the seniors say. Let me give you the senior side of it. Here's what the seniors say. Why they repudiate. We don't understand it. We don't like it. I'm sick of it. I, I go to the bank, I got technology. I go here, I got technology. Everywhere it's technology. It's driving me nuts. 
The only thing I can count on that's the same as it always been is the church, and lo and behold, they're doing the same thing. I've heard that here. Both sides are dead wrong. Both of them. But the point is, because of these extracurricular things that happen, mentoring doesn't take place. What we need and what we're trying to do is not just reach our community, ladies and gentlemen, but to reach out and teach and help those grow in the grace of God. That's going to take some that are older to teach those that are younger. And maybe some of their younger need some that are older because they may know they may be able to do that as well. It's not necessarily an age thing. It's interesting to look at it that way. I've had young people say to me, you have no clue what you're talking about. You can't even do this. I said, yes, I can. I said, da, da, da. And they go, then all of a sudden, somehow I'm credible. That's ridiculous. Just because I know something like that, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. And then I got some older people that will say, this stuff is just ridiculous. It doesn't mean anything, blah, blah, blah. And they check out. And what you just did is you just repudiated a person, which you have no idea what you're talking about. So let's, let's look at this area. So the first thing we see, and I want to get back to the text, the first thing, I told you it would be application here, is there was biblical mentoring going on. I just gave you a list of, I think, 15 different biblical characters where there's mentoring going on. But you've got to want it. You've got to want it. We need that. We need that. No doubt about it. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. We'll throw ourselves there. I want to show you something real quickly. Quick. I'm so glad the sun's not out, so if it was, I'd be watching the rain going down. So uh, we'll see. All right, 2 Timothy. Look what it says there in uh, chapter number 2. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verse number 2. Now, Paul is writing this to his mentor, Excuse me, his mentor is writing this uh, to Timothy. Look what he says. And the things, look at verse number two, that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, how should be able to what? What's the word there? Teach others also. To teach others. Good stuff. Number two, we've got to go quickly. We'll move on. The message of praise and thanksgiving. Let's go back, if we would. Go back to our text, please. Go to Philippians. So, biblical success requires mentoring. All right? By the way, your learning never stops. I have people in my office all the time. I say, what do you think about this? Let's, what do you pray about? We pray about certain things. I have people that I talk to. I talked to my wife. I was reading some scriptures the other day, and I says, you know, I read this, and what do you think about this? What, where can we, what is God trying to say to us? Look what it says in verses 2 to 5, the second part of this. Philippians chapter 1, it's uh, verse number 2. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Always in prayer of mine, for you all making requests of joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. You know, what we find there is a message of praise and thanksgiving. Every remembrance of you, joy, fellowship with the gospel. Paul bursts into a song of thanksgiving here in verse number three. That's not necessarily new for him. You know, when he was in the prison before in Philippi, it was singing and the walls of the Philippian jail echoed with songs of him and Silas before they were free. Every remembrance of you. We need to be praising people. Really? Praise people. Praising people. In every prayer, he made supplication, the Philippians of joy. It's a sheer delight, he's thinking, to pray for them, not dull or drudgery. 
And that's what we see in verse number 3, verse number 2, and the verse number 3. We learn that he was a man of prayer and a man of praise. In verse number 5, he says there was a partnership. That word fellowship means a partnership with us. Could have been financial assistance. It could have been prayer support, devotion to the spread of the good news. But we find here there must be a message of praise. And ladies and gentlemen, a life of praise is not only the most enjoyable way to live, but it's also the most powerful ways to change your life. Praising God. And you see that all through this particular epistle. You know what it's called? The epistle of joy. How many like to hang around with negative, toxic people all the time? Oh, you know. The whole world's always bad, right? There's never a smile, never anything good. There's, and I'm not saying, you know, there's some... Paul was praising. I'm not talking about shallow praising God. I'm talking about a deep-seated joy in my life. No doubt. Living a life of praise is the most enjoyable way to live. Now here's the way we look at it. How many of you like trains? You like, you like to see trains? Especially when you're trying to cross between Route 20 and Route 5 and you got to go, and you're stuck there, and like me, because I'm from Philadelphia, I like to get there quick, and I want to take a U-turn to drive all the way down to go overpass, but I see there's a mile of cars, and this train keeps going and going and going, and then it stops. And I go, are you kidding me? This is a, you know. But you watch trains, and at the end of the train, sometime. What's at the end of the train? What do they call that? A caboose, right? I don't know what caboose means, but I'm sure it means something that's the end. I have no idea. But somebody will Google that and tell me before we're done. But anyway, the end of the train is a caboose. And the tr- that follows, are you with me? It follows everything that was before. So you have this long train, generally of you know, coal or motor cars or oil or toxic waste or whatever you see going down the railroad tracks. It has that little triangle on it, and it's yellow. Remember, that thing turns over, we're all gone, okay? So uh, just a little side note for those of you who don't know what those big cars with the yellow triangle on it and it has a number on it. But anyway, but in the, in the caboose, it follows the train. And that's the way some people... Praise God. Praise isn't a caboose that follows what happens. It should be the engine that makes things happen. And we don't praise God until we like what we see. Paul didn't do that. Are you kidding me? He was in the Philippian jail with Silas, wringing his cup along. I'm just ad-libbing. I don't know if he had a cup, but... Let's say he had a, one of those metal cups and he was ringing it against the bars, praising the Lord in spite of his circumstance. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. We'll wrap this up in a minute. We're just getting started in this epistle of joy. Colossians 2. It says, Paul writes to the church at Colossae in Colossians 2, verse number 7, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding there or full there with what? Thanksgiving. Circle that word, thanksgiving. So, praise should not be in a response to what happens If everything goes right, it should be a part of our life every day. Let me give you a couple verses. John 14, 1 says this. You know, Jesus was saying, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And then he goes on to say, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. If that's true, then we should praise 
Philippians 4.4 4 says this, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say what? Rejoice. That word always, you see that? If you parse that up and take the actual languages out, you know what that means? It means all the time. Don't try to contextualize things. That's what it means. How about this? But the fruit of the Spirit is love. What's after love? Joy. Well, God hasn't given me that. Really, I don't find that there. I love when people like to cherry pick Bible verses and say, I don't have patience. Long suffering there means patience. I don't have that, so I, I like to pick the ones I want that I have. That's not true. Gentleness, goodness, faith. And it goes on and says, with, this, with such there against there is no law. So now we find a third area of biblical mature, biblical success. And this is really key. Three, there's a mentoring going on. There's a praising and praying going on. And we're not even getting started into the epistle yet. And thirdly, can I just say this? We ain't quitting. We're not quitting. We're going to continue in spite of it. And what he's talking about here, of course, the, the actual, the way the verse reads, and properly so, if you want to if you go through it, it means we're, we know that we will be saved. We know there will be a day of Christ Jesus and we'll see him. That's the ultimate goal. But the point I'm trying to make here is and be confident in this very thing that God has begun a good work in you and he's going to perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. A ministry of continuing. Biblical success is not measured by how you start, now don't miss this, but how you finish. Really? Recently, and it came out today actually, it's about the last month, there's some big name evangelical person, and I don't agree with their doctrine, I don't even want to know, has fallen into some area. One of them actually committed suicide yesterday. A very large church in California. We've had some that have come out and, you know, now the very thing they preached against, that's what they are. And we've got all of this stuff going on. Are you with me? Listen to me. And they may have started right, but they finished rotten. And guess what? They're going to be known by how they what? Finished. And what Paul is saying here, what he began in you will be completed. It's how you finish. Think about that. Oh, I can give illustrations about sports stars and the Bill Buckner ball that went between the legs of the 1986 World Series. I can go on and on and on. I can talk about certain illustrations in business and in life. But many people are known how they finish because they finish pretty rotten. Everybody look here. That ought to be really convicting to us. It's convicting, it's encouraging. You know what's encouraging? Let's say you had, you messed up. Let's say you blew it. Guess what? As long as you're, there's time, you've got a chance to finish right. You've got a chance to finish right. And what Paul is saying here, there's a ministry of continuation. Great confidence. He prayed for the Philippians. This is the, the perfect tense of that Greek word indicates that Paul had come to a settled conviction that he was confident this was true. No doubt. He'd settled it. And that's what we see here. So, what do we see? I think that's the last. I thought I had two more slides, and for some reason, uh, if I could get my men in the sound room, because I do have a video after. There it goes. I'm sorry. Let me go back. So, we go to the next one. So, biblical success, as we start this epistle, as he leads in with Timothy, he was a mentor. Your children. I'd hate to live the life and just kind of go off on my own. And be isolated. And not have a chance to impact anybody else. There's a message there of praise. Oh, that we would praise God. You know, people are just accepting negativity. And a minute's ministry of continuation. We're going to watch a video now. And uh, this is very interesting. We showed this two years ago. I think it was almost two years ago. Parts of this. 
there's so many people caught up into false religion. The Ganges River, I think that's pronounced that, Ganges, Ganges River, how's that pronounced? Anybody know? Is the most holy, sacred place in Hinduism. It's a nasty, mud-laden river. We're not going to look at the church they started here, but we're going to show you the idolatry and the lostness. And rather than looking at the people there with indignation, that could be you by the grace of God. So let's look at this if we can. And I want you to watch this particular video. It's very short. It's only about six minutes. I woke to a vast green sea of rice as our train lurched on toward Varanasi. I made up coffee in my water bottle in search of consciousness. Had a night of only napping, accompanied by a chorus of snores that sounded like a company of organs. <laughs> no worse, bagpipes. The train is much quieter now that it's morning. Travelers are lolling about, bored and sleepy as our train sails through the Emerald Sea of Rice on the plains of Uttar Pradesh. These snatched views from my train window are like a rail traveler remarked long ago, just seeing bits of unfinished life. There's a man living under an umbrella, his possessions all under its shadow a one-armed man rushing to catch the train, his sleeve sweeping past him. Giggling schoolgirls tripping along a dusty road. In the distant rice fields, women in bright saris bend to their tasks, dotting the green void like a string of gems. reached Varanasi yesterday. Our driver here is a man named Somnat. He has been a big help in getting around the city. He is a devotee of Ganesh. Johnson took the opportunity to share Christ, Ishu Masi, with him. Johnson's approach is to ask searching questions, modeled after Jesus' approach to engaging in gospel conversations. May the Lord give Somnat light to know him. For much of its 3,000 years, Varanasi was called Kashi, City of Light. I think nothing could be further from the truth. This is the holiest city of Hinduism. Their Mecca, huddled along the muddy Ganges, which they worship as a goddess and believe that its waters can wash away sins. Walk toward the river and the ghats, the steps that descend into it. The streets were filled with holy cows and holy men. One of these sadhus greeted me with an om and with the hope of a cash contribution to help him manage his vow of poverty. <laughs> The way he wore the flowers in his hair, he looked like a walking flower pot. I nicknamed him Marigold. He was quite a character. The sheer scale of this spectacle gives weight to the worship. When you get past the hucksters and the backpackers here to smoke cheap hash, when you get past the boatmen and the souvenir sellers, there are millions who come here each year to drink this sacred water and to wash away their sins. 
these that sit hopelessly scrubbing at their sins in a muddy river do not yet know of grace, of the Lord's awesome work he spoke of in Ezekiel. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart, and a new spirit I will put within you. Negotiated with a boatman to take us out on the Ganges for a few bucks. The Ganges was swirling and swollen, overflowing from the heavy monsoon rains upstream. But it was good to get away from the stench of the shore and to get out on the open waters in the gathering dusk. I wanted to see the ghat known as Mani Karnika, the place of the burning of the dead. Here, fires burn continuously, consuming up to a hundred corpses a day. Boats tethered to the shore were piled high with the wood which fuels the eternal flame. The people believe that to die here and to have their ashes scattered on the Ganges leads to instant nirvana, freeing them from the otherwise endless cycle of birth and rebirth. This is the portal to paradise. Immortality, though, comes with a price. The wood has to be bought. And for the lowest caste, their dead are often burned in mass. If they can't afford enough wood, the half-burned corpses are simply dumped into the river. The bodies of men are covered in a white shroud and women in orange. There were two dead women being readied for the funeral pyre. Above their corpses, Flames burn bright with flesh. We moved on as the oarsmen pulled against the current. Last light brightened the river, but evil hung in the air, along with the stench of death, as night descended over the Ganges. Pretty interesting how a group of people